Hey guys, with the social distancing and stay-at-home orders across the country, seemed like a good time to put together a quick video on the coronavirus and COVID-19. First, let's take a look at a virus. Viruses come in many shapes and sizes, but all have common features. This version is called a head and tail configuration with an icosahedral or prolate head made up of multiple equilateral triangles arranged in a symmetric fashion. The coronavirus, on the other hand, is a spherical envelope with multiple spike-like projections emanating from the viral surface, creating a crown appearance, hence the moniker corona. All our cells in our bodies contain double helix strand of DNA and all the protein-making machinery like ribosomes to allow the cell to function and reproduce. Viruses contain a single or double strand of either DNA or RNA, but have none of the protein-making capabilities and therefore cannot reproduce on their own. They have to infect and utilize our cells to survive and proliferate. Regardless of the viral design, the surface projections, in this case the tail fibers, are designed to attach to specific protein or molecular targets on the host cell surface. Once attached, the virus gains access to the cell and injects its own genetic material into the cytoplasm. The virus genetic code then commandeers the protein-making machinery of the host cell to make new copies of the virus itself which then bud or break through the host cell membrane to infect a new cell and start the process again. Alternatively, the newly formed viruses can be coughed, sneezed, or defecated from the body where they enter the atmosphere and can then infect a new host altogether. The coronavirus is a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus, which we will clarify in a moment. First, I want to show you how our cells produce the proteins necessary to keep us alive and then I'll explain the specifics of how the coronavirus uses these tools to replicate and spread itself. As you know, each of our cells contains a central nucleus which holds all our genetic material that makes us who we are. The nucleus sits in the cell cytoplasm along with other cell organelles like lysosomes and ribosomes, all of which are contained by the outer cell membrane. Now our precious DNA, the blueprint of our entire existence, never leaves the protection of the nucleus but somehow needs to get its encoded information to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm for protein production. This is done through RNA transcriptase. For clarity, we'll simplify our model getting rid of the cell membrane and cytoplasm, showing you only the encapsulated nucleus and surrounding organelles. The transcriptase reads the genetic code and produces messenger RNA or mRNA. This genetic template can leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. The ribosome, with a large and small subunit, then reads the messenger RNA, assembling a series of amino acids into a specific order, which then fold into a complex 3D geometry, producing all the necessary structural and enzymatic proteins that keep us alive. The projections on the coronavirus are actually receptors that look for a specific host protein on the cell surface in which to bind. In this case, the receptor is an enzyme precursor called angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. ACE2 is a transmural metalloprotein, which means it extends all the way from the outer to the inner surface of the cell membrane and consists of a zinc metal attached to a protein support molecule. These proteins are found throughout the body, including lining of our blood vessels, kidneys, lungs, and GI tracts, which may explain some of the presenting symptoms, such as pneumonia, GI distress, neurologic changes, and kidney failure. Normally, an enzyme called shedase cleaves the external portion of the metalloprotein, which then enters the circulation and lowers blood pressure by counteracting the effects of a hormone called angiotensin II. Once the spike receptor protein on the coronavirus attaches to the ACE2 site, the virus can then invade the host cell. The exact methodology of invasion is not completely clear, but probably involves one of the two following mechanisms. The linking of the spike in the ACE2 membrane protein produces conformational changes in the spike protein, which may activate host cell proteases, enzymes that break down proteins. These proteases break down the surface and envelope proteins of the virus and the adjacent cell membrane of the host, allowing the two receptacles to communicate. The virus can then pass its genetic code into the host cytoplasm. Alternatively, once the spike encounters the ACE2 membrane protein, the entire virus enters the cell through a process called endocytosis. A portion of the host cell membrane completely engulfs the virus, producing an endosome or vesicle. Even though the virus is now physically inside the cell membrane of its host, 
it still needs to deliver its genetic code to the ribosomes for reproduction. Enter the lysosome. Lysosomes are small organelles that contain a number of chemicals like proteases used to break down the protein structures of food and pathogens, sort of the stomach for each of the body cells. For optimal function of all these chemicals and proteases, the internal pH of the lysosome is acidic at about 4. This will be important when we're talking about potential treatments in a moment. The lysosome and endosome fuse, allowing the contents of the lysosome to work on the viral envelope and surface proteins. Again, this process allows the envelope and endosome membrane to fuse, providing a conduit for the viral genome to enter the host cell cytoplasm. Coronavirus genetic material is a positive sense RNA genome of about 30,000 bases, quite large considering some viruses contain a few dozen bases. Positive sense means that the viral RNA structurally resembles messenger RNA or mRNA of our host cells and therefore can be read and translated directly by the host ribosome. Remember, our DNA molecule is made up of a string of four nucleotides, thymine, adenosine, cystosine, and guanine. On the complementary string, A always links up to T, T to A, G to C, and C to G. This allows the two strands to reliably duplicate during mitosis, assembling a perfect match during division. RNA has a similar four-base nucleotide code, three of which are identical to DNA, including adenosine, guanine, and cystosine, but RNA contains uracil instead of thiamine, with adenosine always linking to uracil and guanine always linking to cystosine. So the single strand of RNA from the virus can be read directly by our ribosome to make proteins, but there is no way to use the host cell organelles to actually replicate the genetic code to make more viral particles or reproduce. Remember, all our DNA duplication takes place in the confines of the nucleus, isolated from the cytoplasm. Fortunately for the virus, and unfortunately for us, the virus has figured this out. The first 20,000 bases, two-thirds of the entire genetic code, are used in the production of a complex protein molecule called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RNA replicase. This protein molecule serves multiple functions in the viral replication process and is important as a possible target for therapy. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can now read the viral RNA and make a complementary RNA strand linking adenosine to uracil and guanine to cystosine. The new RNA strand is basically a matching template of the original positive sense RNA and is therefore called a negative sense RNA strand. This strand cannot be read by our ribosomes to make protein, but can be used by the newly assembled RNA polymerase to make new, positive-sense copies of the genetic code replicating the original RNA. The RNA transcriptase can read the negative-sense RNA template a second time and produce small pieces of positive-sense genetic material that encode for the four structural proteins of the new virus. These smaller pieces are called subgenomic, since they only include small portions of the entire genetic code. The smaller RNA fragments are then read by the host ribosome to produce the structural parts of the new virus. The new structural and surface proteins are then assembled into new viral particles, loaded with a copy of the genomic RNA, encapsulated in a membrane within the cytoplasm, and delivered outside of the cell through excitosis or budding. Once outside the cell, the process begins again. So just to summarize, the viral particle invades the host cell and delivers its positive sense RNA to the cell cytoplasm. The host cell ribosome reads the first 20,000 bases of the genetic code and assembles a protein-based RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or RNA replicase. The replicase protein reads the original viral RNA to produce a negative sense copy or template of the genetic code. This template can then be used by the replicase protein to produce short segment subgenomic sequences of positive sense RNA that can then be read by the host ribosome to reproduce the structural proteins of the viral capsule. Alternatively, the entire template can be translated by the replicase protein into a new copy of the original RNA viral genome. At this point, the structural proteins are assembled around the viral RNA, producing a new viral particle. 
The single-stranded RNA replication process, completely independent of the double-stranded DNA, is horribly inaccurate, resulting in many coding errors and mutations. In addition, since the replication process happens freely in the host cytoplasm, the process is completely unregulated. The replicase will haphazardly reproduce its own genetic code or the code of another infecting virus, possibly a subtype from a different host that has invaded the organism. Segments of genetic code from both subtypes can be combined into a new organism, a process called genetic chimerism. Named after the chimera, a fire-breathing creature from Greek mythology that has the head of a lion, body of a goat, and tail of a serpent, the chimera graphically represents the combining of different organisms into one. In fact, the current coronavirus is felt to be a chimeric recombination of a known bat coronavirus and a coronavirus from another species, possibly the pangolin, an armored anteater. This smorgasbord of genetic material, frequent mutations, and chimerism allows the virus to adapt quickly to a changing environment in a preferred host or adapt to a completely new host altogether. This, of course, can make it challenging to effectively treat this particular type of viral infection. With this review of the infection and reproduction process of the coronavirus, let's look at some of the proposed treatment regimens that are being investigated and developed. The ultimate treatment for the virus, of course, is a vaccine. On the surface of the coronavirus are various proteinaceous structures, including the spike, nucleocapsid, membrane, and envelope proteins, which can all be potential targets. If these proteins can be harvested and injected into the bloodstream, our immune system can be trained to recognize, attack, and destroy the virus particles before they overwhelm the body, thus lessening the impact of the infection. The development of an effective vaccine may take years. In the interim, without the luxury of time, a number of anecdotal therapies have been proposed to reduce the clinical symptoms of a COVID infection. The antibiotics azithromycin and doxycycline are bacteriostatic drugs that don't kill bacteria directly, but stop them from reproducing by binding to their ribosomal large and small subunits, respectively. This sounds promising since we now know that coronavirus uses our ribosomes to reproduce. However, as far as we know, these medications only cross the cell membranes of bacteria, but not our own cells, and therefore, their efficacy in treating a viral infections in humans is questionable. Hydrochloroquine or Plaquenil, an antimalarial, anti-rheumatoid medication, appears to accumulate in lysosomes of our cells, raising the pH from the acidic 4 to a more neutral 6. Again, the proteases and other enzymes in the lysosome function optimally in the acidic environment. The elevated pH may reduce the function of these chemicals, preventing uncoding of the viral RNA and essentially entombing the particle in the endosome. Remdesivir is an investigational drug for the treatment of various RNA viruses in humans. Essentially an adenosine analog, once administered, remdesivir is inserted into the RNA chain, resulting in a conformational change that prevents the chain from entering the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase for reproduction. Medications that bind to and block the ACE2 metalloprotein would theoretically block the virus from attaching to the host cell membrane. However, since this enzyme is involved in blood pressure modulation, the clinical effects are uncertain and more research is necessary. As we have found out, the clinical response to a coronavirus infection is quite variable, ranging from completely asymptomatic to death. This may be multifactorial, including the patient's baseline health and immune status, and possibly a genetic predilection for infection due to the number and variant configurations of the ACE2 metalloprotein. The latest research has shown that the novel coronavirus has a predilection for the beta subunit of human hemoglobin in certain individuals. Hemoglobin is a metalloprotein with two alpha and two beta subunits. Looking at one of the subunits, there is a protein base or globin attached to the iron-containing heme molecule. The molecule consists of a porphyrin ring which is chemically bonded to the oxygen-carrying central iron atom. The surface proteins of the virus can bind to the porphyrin ring and dislodge the central iron atom. This scavenging of porphyrin reduces the number of oxygen-carrying molecules in the circulation, contributing to the symptoms of severe shortness of breath. Again, there may be a genetic propensity for this type of porphyrin scavenging related to the specific surface proteins on our individual red blood cells, possibly explaining the variability of clinical presentation from person to person. In the last few minutes, I want to discuss some of the nomenclature associated with the coronavirus and COVID-19. 
The current coronavirus was first reported out of Wuhan, China in December of 2019. With similarities to the SARS outbreak in 2002, the new virus was initially called 2019 NCoV, which stood for the 2019 novel coronavirus. Once we had a more complete understanding of the viral genotype, the viral name was formally changed at the end of January 2020 to SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And the disease caused by the virus is now called COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. Just like HIV, or the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, causes the disease AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. The original SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome of 2002, was caused by the SARS-CoV, now named SARS-CoV-1. The 2012 MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, is caused by the virus MERS-CoV. Historically, the 2002 SARS outbreak killed about 10% of all those infected. The 2012 MERS outbreak, about 30%. Estimates of mortality rates associated with SARS-CoV-2 are currently difficult without a good denominator, as testing in most places is currently limited to the symptomatic patients. In areas where there is extensive testing of the general population, there are reports of 30-50% to 50 of patients who are completely asymptomatic despite testing positive for the virus. These individuals are known as carriers. This potentially high prevalence of asymptomatic carriers and rapid mutations of the virus itself will make an effective cure difficult. Social distancing limits the immediate spread of disease so we don't overwhelm the local health care system and gives us time to develop a vaccine or treatment regimen that lessens the impact of disease. In the meantime, keep your distance and stay safe. Thanks for watching.